Melvin, I appreciate Melvin. Melvin, uh, Melvin's one of those people who can sing and preach, and I just, I just resent that all to pieces. I tell you what. I... <laughs> oh, I love Melvin. I tell you, I appreciate you, brother. That was beautiful. If you have your Bibles, let's turn to Matthew chapter five this morning. As we're continuing our series on the Beatitudes, Matthew chapter five, beginning. We're well, actually going to look at one verse. We're going to look at verse nine as we come to. Verse uh, 9 of the Beatitudes. Back during World War I, when World War I first broke out, the president of Columbia University sent a survey to his faculty and he asked them, he said, what are you going to do to support the war effort? And one of the members of the faculty, who was a pacifist and had been vocally opposed to the war, sent his back and he said, I'm going to mind my own doggone business is what I'm going to do. Well, folks, our business is to make peace. It is our business to be peacemakers in this world. And Christ speaks to that very issue in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and grace and kindness. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us your holy, inspired, and inerrant word. We ask, Lord, that we would hear it and that we would be like Christ, that we would be called sons of God, that, Lord, we would be peacemakers in this world. In Christ's name we pray these things. Amen. The Bible opens with uh, mankind living in the Garden of Eden in perfect peace, and then it ends with him in eternity, once again, in perfect peace. But in and between, i got to be honest with you, there's not a whole lot of peace. Historians tell us that since Christ's day, we have seen more than 14,000 wars that we have actually recognized. And even when our own country has not been at war, we have had a civil unrest, crime, protests, sit-ins, marches of every kind. It just seems that conflict is a part of our very nature, part of who we are, a part of our existence in this world. And yet the Bible says that as believers in Jesus Christ, we are to be called peacemakers. It is a characteristic of a believer in Christ that we are peacemakers. It is part of our character, part of our makeup, part of who we are that we are known to be peacemakers. We exemplify peace. Now understand when I say that we are peacemakers, I'm not speaking here of the kind of peace that we think of that UN, the UN seeks after or that diplomats work toward, but instead we are called to exemplify the peace that people can have with God. And as a result of that peace, the peace that we can have inside, the inner peace that only God can give and only His children can demonstrate. So being peacemakers is a family trait that we share with our Father God. And Paul loved to refer to God as the God of peace. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our God is a God of peace. I remember hearing a story about a missionary who was working in a island amongst a group of people in the South Pacific. And he was trying to come up with a way to explain what God had done through Jesus Christ in trying to reconcile us to himself. And he came upon a, a tradition, a kind of an odd tradition that this, uh, this people, these people who lived on this island had. Apparently, whenever two tribes were at war, they had a tradition whereby when they decided to make peace, they would take a child from one of the tribes and they would, be, they would give the child to be raised by the other tribe. And that way, as the child grew up, he had ties to both sides and he would be the agent of peace between the two of them. They called him the peace child. And he said, that's it. That's what God did. He gave his only son in order to reconcile himself and mankind. Christ became the peace child. And like our Father, like our God our Father, we are called to seek and minister 
peace, to be agents of reconciliation between God and man as well. The child of God, the person who's born again, the person who knows Christ as their Savior, becomes a peacemaker. And we do that by seeing things differently than the world does. And I'm going to suggest to you today that we see at least three things differently than the world does. First, we see the world itself in a different way than the world does. The source of the world's problems, of all the world's problems, is sin. And no approach that does not deal with sin will ever bring peace between individuals or between nations or peace in our hearts. The root of every conflict is sin. It's lust and greed and selfishness and cruelty. And no amount of discussion or negotiations is going to change the hearts of human beings. I'll admit to you, I am I am uh, very skeptical uh, of the UN ever having any real impact for peace in this world. And the reason I'm skeptical about that is because the United Nations, as a rule, ignores the fundamental problem of humanity, the source of all conflict. I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. When the AIDS crisis erupted in, in Africa, uh, in Africa there's a, there's a, a terrible, rav, uh, uh, terrible uh, crisis uh, with, with AIDS. It's ravaging nations in Africa, has been for decades now. And when it first began to spread and, and infection rates began to rise just astronomically, the UN was looking for ways to slow this down, to stop this thing. What they found was there was one nation in all of Africa that was seeing actually a decline decline in infection rates instead of an increase. And so the UN said, well, we'll send a team in there, find out what they're doing, we can do it in other countries, and, and we'll stop this thing. And so they went to Uganda, and they got there, and the, the people in Uganda said, well, the First Lady is actually in charge of this project. She's in charge of, of controlling the, the spread of AIDS in our, in our country. That's her pet project. Well, let's talk to her. They brought her in. They said, what are you doing? She said, oh, it's very easy. She said, we're bringing people together, and we're telling them about Jesus Christ, and we're teaching them that the, the, the ethics of Jesus Christ says that that sex outside of marriage is wrong and that abstinence is the way to go and that's actually decreasing the infection rates. It's working. And the UN looked at her and said, we can't do that. We can't do that. So they packed up and left. Millions of people dying from AIDS all across Africa because the UN can't deal with the fundamental problem that people have and that is a lack of a relationship with Jesus Christ. Sin is the problem. The same is true in wars and conflicts. You know, I would love to see peace in the Middle East in, in my lifetime. But folks, that's not going to happen apart from the triumph of the gospel of Jesus Christ in that region. You want to work for peace? You want to see peace around the world? Give to missions. You want to see peace around the world? Volunteer for missions. Spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ will reconcile people in a way that nothing else can do. The secular world says that what the world needs in order to bring peace is more wealth and more education. If you give people money and you, you educate them, you'll see wars and conflicts go away. But you know the truth is? The truth is that if you give people more money, you know what you get? Better financed wars. That's what you get. You know what the truth is? If you, if you educate people and you know what you get, you get clever devils who build bigger bombs. That's what you get. Wealth, education will never bring peace to our world. Germany was the wealthiest, most educated nation in the entire world when they started World War II and gassed six million Jews to death. Sinful men cannot create peace either within themselves or with other people around them because sin is the source of all conflict. Jesus Christ says that we are to be peacemakers and we are peacemakers by bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost world. People say, yeah, but you know, when you preach the gospel, sometimes you alienate people, sometimes you separate people, and that's true, that's true. See, bringing the peace to the world 
is very much like a surgeon. See, well, a surgeon has to cut before he can heal. And sometimes you have to preach the gospel, which sometimes upsets people before you can bring real peace. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 34, Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. What did he mean? He meant that when you preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's going to turn some people off. It's going to upset some people. It's going to bring conflict within families. When I was in seminary, I knew a young man. He grew up in a Muslim family, a Muslim household. And when he converted to Jesus Christ, his own brother tried to kill him. He fled his own house in the middle of the night. Only thing he had on, he was barefoot, all he had on was a pair of jeans. And when I met him in seminary, to that day his family would have nothing to do with him because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, the bad news of the gospel has to come before the good news can have any effect. The truth will often produce anger in people before it produces joy. The gospel often brings bad feelings before it brings good ones. I heard a man give a testimony one time. He talked about the, the fact that uh, he first went to church, first time he went to church because his wife nagged him into it. Some of you are in the same shape this morning. You're, you're here because somebody nagged you into coming. He said, I went to church because I just wanted to get her off my back. He said, I went to church and I'm sitting there and that preacher stands up and he starts saying things like, everybody's a sinner. He said, you're a sinner. And I thought, I'm not a sinner. I thought, he said that, that everybody was a sinner. He said, well, I thought, well, I'm as good as the next person. Then he said, well, the next person was probably going to go to hell. And he said that the only way to salvation was through faith in Jesus Christ. There was only one way. He said when the, when the sermon was over, he said, I jumped up and I ran out the back door and I sat down in the car and slammed the door, waited for my wife. She came and sat down. She said, what's wrong? And I said, that man's crazy. I'm not going back to hear him again. He said, but you know something? All week I thought about what he said. All week the Holy Spirit worked in his heart. The next Sunday morning, he got up early, he got dressed. His wife said, where are you going? And he said, I'm going to go hear that crazy man again. You going with me? <laughs> the gospel of Jesus Christ sometimes causes bad feelings before it causes joy. Sometimes it causes division before it brings peace. But folks, let me tell you this. Peace cannot exist where sin remains. And so we stand against sin and unrighteousness, and often that doesn't win us friends, but you can't bring peace to the world by being just like the world. The Bible says we're to be salt, we're to be light, we're to be different from the world. And most of all, the Christian recognizes that the world needs something more than just a little tweak, a little adjustment. The world needs to be made over. The world needs a facelift. The world needs a heart transplant. You and I need a total recreation. And that will only come through the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Being a peacemaker means that we bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost world, proclaiming the good news that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins, that he was buried, that he was raised again on the third day as evidence that he was who he said he was and that everything he taught was the truth and that folks that will bring peace between you and God accepting that message so we see the world differently but as peacemakers we also see ourselves differently see ultimately conflict arises because of selfishness self interest Whenever you see two people in conflict, whether it is in a marriage or a family or in a church or, or two nations in conflict, it's always because somebody is being selfish. But the Bible says that as believers in Christ, as children of the living God, we're supposed to be different. We are bondservants of Christ now, and so we're interested in only one thing, or we should be interested in only one thing, that is the glory of God. Ideally, we're no longer motivated by self-interest because we have a new mission. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 says, Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry 
of reconciliation. We've been given a job. We've been given the job of taking the gospel, the message of reconciliation to a lost world. We have been trusted with the ministry of reconciliation. That is our purpose in living. That's our purpose in being here. So now, rather than promoting ourselves and our own interests, we promote Christ and the gospel and the ministry of reconciliation and that means we're going to live differently for Christ's sake we're going to make an effort to live peaceably with others so the gospel gets a hearing so that the love of Christ can impact people Romans chapter 12 verse 18 if it is possible as much as depends on you live peaceably with all people Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. For Christ's sake, we're going to be in control of our actions, preferring to be wronged rather than promoting our own rights. Why? Because we want to promote the gospel. We're going to be in control of our attitude, recognizing that the only thing we really deserve is God's wrath, but we receive mercy and grace instead. So we've got a different attitude. And most of all, and perhaps hardest of all, we're going to be in control of our tongues and what we say. You know, the United Nations was created. The principle behind the United Nations was that if you could get people together and get them talking, that you could avoid wars and conflicts. You know, the Bible teaches exactly the opposite. The Bible teaches that if you want to avoid conflict, just shut up. James chapter 1, verse 19. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Hold your tongue. You know, th that is really hard, isn't it? Because more often than not, when we just have to open our mouths, we pour gas on the fire. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones, the great English preacher, he said, if you have to, organize for war. Preferably, organize for peace. But whatever you do, just stop talking. Because when we talk, when we open our mouths, we tend to pour f uh, fuel on the fire. Now, as I said earlier, this doesn't mean that we, we seek peace at any price because we're not going to compromise the gospel. But we will do our best to contend for the faith without being contentious. We're going to do our best to disagree with people without being disagreeable. We're going to do our best to confront others without going to war with them. Because the peacemaker always seeks to speak a word of truth in love. Colossians 4.6 says, Let your speech always, speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Because remember, we're not working for ourselves. We're representing the king. The Bible says that we are ambassadors for Christ. We are ambassadors in a strange land, a foreign country. Folks, an ambassador does not go around picking fights in the country where he's representing his king, does he? He does his best to develop friendly relations with the, the country that he's in because he wants to have a hearing. He wants to represent his nation well. We are ambassadors for Christ. We are foreign ambassadors in a foreign world, and so we live differently in order to get a hearing for the gospel. So we see the world differently. We see ourselves differently. But we also see people differently. When we look at people around us that are lost in sin, people who are vile and debased and abusive, we are not supposed to react to them like the world does. We see them as captives. We see them as deceived, as blinded by sin, as captives of Satan. And so we have pity on them. We understand that but for the grace of God, there go I. But for the grace of God, I would be just as bad as they are. We view them with compassion. We view them with the love of God. I, I read a story not long ago about a man who was arrested in New York City. Uh, he, was, he owned a loft in the city 
and uh, there was a raid on the loft and uh, the loft was full of every kind of homeless person, drug addict, uh, bum, alcoholic, just the, the lowest dregs of society were staying in this loft and the police came in, they found a few of them had drugs on them and so they just arrested everybody, took them down to the station and sorted them out down there. And so when they're going through and, and at the arraignment hearing, they brought the man who owned the loft in. And what they discovered was that he was a man by the name of Sergeant Cram. He was a multimillionaire, a Princeton graduate, and that he owned this loft. And so the, the judge asked him, what, what is the story here? And he said, well, he became just very convicted that he needed to do something to help people, that his life needed to matter. And so he decided he was going to work with the lowest of the low, the, the people who were the lowest in society. And so he went to New York, he went to one of the worst neighborhoods there, he bought this loft, and he thought, if I can give people a warm place to stay, if I can give them a hot meal, if I can do something, at least I can help people a little bit. And the, the judge said, well, if you will do your best to keep drugs out of this loft, I'll let you go. So he did. He agreed to that. Let him go. But the, the media followed up with that. that There's two interesting stories. So they went and asked him. They said, why do you do this? You could be living a life of luxury. Why do you live in one of the worst neighborhoods in America dealing with the, the, the lowest of the society? Why do you do this? And he said this. He said, I do it because it is my calling. It is my reason for living. Folks, we have a calling. Christ has placed a calling on our life. We have a reason for living. It is the ministry of reconciliation bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost world, reconciling lost people with the God of the universe. That's our calling. It's our reason for existing. It's why we are here. I'm told by, by many people that uh, knew my dad that I look just like he did when he was younger. There's a strong family resemblance. The Bible says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Why? Because our God is a God of peace. And we never look more like Him than when we are ministering peace to a lost and dying world. There's a family resemblance when we are seeking to be peacemakers. A family resemblance between us and the God of peace. But before we can be a peacemaker in this world, we need peace with God ourselves. You see, this ministry of reconciliation starts with us. We have to be reconciled to the living God before we can bring the message of reconciliation to anybody else. Before we can preach it to someone else, we have to know Christ as our Savior ourselves. The Bible says we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death, separation from God for eternity in a place called hell. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ who died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. He was buried and raised again on the third day. Folks, that's the gospel, the ministry of reconciliation. Do you know Christ is your Savior today? Do you have peace with God? Because you'll never know the peace of God inside you until you have peace with God. The Bible says that God offers you salvation today. If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. God offers you freely the gift of eternal life. All you have to do is receive it. Turn from the way you were living, turn from your sins and give your life to Christ and His service now and you will have heaven and eternal life. You will have peace with God and in your heart you will have the peace of God. A peace that Jesus says passeth understanding. If you're here this morning, you don't have peace with God. You don't know the peace of God. I'm going to invite you in just a moment. As I stand in the front here, we're going to sing a hymn. I'm going to invite you to step out in the aisle and come to the front and say, Pastor, I want to know this peace you've been talking about. I want to know Jesus as my Savior. I want to know that I have heaven and eternal life guaranteed to me forever. And I'll pray with you and show you how you can know Christ as your Savior. And I'll show you what your next step as a believer in Jesus Christ needs to be. My prayer is that no one would leave this place not living in peace with God. 
Maybe you're here this morning and you're a believer in Jesus Christ. But you have not been an agent of peace in this world. You have not accepted the, the charge that Christ has given you to be the minister of peace, to be the minister of reconciliation in this world. I'm going to encourage you today to repent of that sin and say, Lord, from now on, I'm going to do what I can to minister your peace in this world to live at peace with other people, that they might hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, that I might be able to share the gospel with those who are lost. I'm going to get serious about sharing the gospel with lost people around me. On Tuesday nights, we're doing a program. We're calling it Fishers of Men. If you want to be a part of that ministry of reconciliation, I'm going to invite you to come out and be a part of that on Tuesday night, 6.30, and we will show you how, I will train you how to share your faith with other people so that you can be a part of that ministry of reconciliation. I'm going to encourage you to come out and be a part of that. Maybe you're here this morning, you know Christ is your Savior, but you need a church home, a place where people love you, where they care about you, where, where the Word of God is proclaimed. I can't think of a better place to bring your family to be a part of our family than Younger's Creek Baptist Church this morning. We'll receive you as a Baptist Church receives members. But let's be obedient to God's call in our lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us the ministry of reconciliation. We thank you, Lord, that you have called us not only to peace with you, but to bring peace to the world. We ask, Lord, that Younger's Creek Baptist Church would be uh, a city set on a hill, a, a light of peace to a lost world. Lord, we ask that we as individuals would be ministers of reconciliation to a lost world. Lord, give us boldness and wisdom and grace and that, help that we would share the gospel in a way that would be winsome and attractive to friends and family and lost people around us. Lord, we ask that you would move in power this morning. If there's someone here that doesn't know Christ, that you would draw them to salvation. And Lord, we just give you praise and honor and glory for all that you do. In Christ's name, amen. Let's stand for our hymn of invitation this morning.